Every day I become more convinced that there is a ton of truth in the common phrase, more than meets the eye. You've heard that phrase before, yeah? You look around and you see certain things, but I think that it is critically important if you're going to live well to recognize that what you can see when you first look at something, it does not tell the whole picture. Now, there's a lot of different ways of saying this very same thing. There was this poet who lived like a thousand years ago named, Fa- two thousand years ago named Phaedrus, who's, who said, things are not always as they seem. The first appearance deceives many. And that's fine, but I kind of like the simpler version of it. There's more than meets the eye. I, I think about that when I look at this room. Now, a cynical person could look at this room and could say that, yeah, the adults in the room hope that what you have are a number of young people who are indeed leaning into what Jesus is doing in their life and who are here because they want to see God work and because they're interested in who he is and what he might have for them by way of kingdom work. But a cynical person would say that that's just what the adults hope, that really what you have is a bunch of confused and distracted young people who aren't able to focus on what God is doing. Maybe they're thinking about who they're sitting next to. Do they like this person? Do they not like this person? Are they going to gossip about this person later? Maybe they're competing. Who knows all the things that are going on? But when I look at the room, that's not what I see. What I look in the room is, what I see is opportunity. What I see is possibility. What I see is indeed a, a group of young people who are imperfect but are here and whose stories are going to be continued in some form or another. I believe that the story of the world that moves forward and hinges on moments that change everything, but that the moments that change everything, when you're in the middle of them, they kind of look like all the other moments. They don't necessarily seem that impressive from the outside. And do I have any like history lovers in the room? Like four of you, okay, I'll tell you that story later. How about this? Okay, do any of you watch Netflix in the room? Yes, some of you, you're allowed to make noise if you want to, but raising your hands works. Have any of you seen Stranger Things season three? You have? Okay, good. I promise I'm not going to ruin it, but it's like in the first episode of Stranger Things season three, which Caleb and I disagree on. I still think season one is best. He kind of thinks three is best. You can help him under, you can help us kind of navigate our way through that tension. But in Stranger Things season three, at the very opening episode, there's this scene where Billy is driving down the street and he's headed to meet Mrs. Wheeler for a rendezvous at a hotel, which is of course very creepy, but it's also kind of in keeping with the characters. You know what I'm saying? And he's driving down the street and he's in his cool car and he's looking in the mirror and he's practicing his lines and it all just seems for the story sort of normal and then boom something happens and if you've seen it you know what I'm talking about that makes the whole story different it's just a normal moment and then something took place that changed everything driving down the street it's not that big a deal right or is it how about this some of you are super passionate about this or at least one of you is have you guys seen the Avengers movies right like you know what they are yeah do you remember the first time you heard in an Avengers movie about an infinity stone do you do that's impressive like I don't even remember the first time it came up Because honestly, at the time, I didn't really know what an Infinity Stone was. It's just another weird detail in some cool, fun, but weird movies. And then as it progresses, you recognize that this was actually central to the plot line of this phase phase of the story. That's what I'm talking about. Like, sometimes there's more than meets the eye. And I think the same thing is true with our story today. If you have your Bibles, go ahead and open them up to 1 Kings chapter 17. We're going to read 1 Kings 17, 8 through 24. And let me just say, while you're getting your Bibles out or tuning your phones to the Bible app, I fully recognize that some of you are newer to the Bible than others. And in a context like that, you might feel like embarrassed about that. Please, if you could just take it from me, like you don't need to be embarrassed about that. If you're new to the Bible, awesome. That means like you're, you're you know, coming to the Bible. And the way it works is the Bible is divided into a bunch of different books and those books are divided into chapters and verses. So if you look at the top of the Bible and it has like 1 Kings 18.4 on the top of mine, that's the book, the chapter, and the verse. And so if you hear somebody like me say, turn to 1 Kings chapter 17, all you got to do is flip over to the table of contents, find 1 Kings, and then you should be able to do it from there. For now, I'm going to have you listen into to this story. And anytime you're reading a story from the Bible, the most important thing to do is to try to picture with your eyes the events that are taking place. 1 Kings chapter 17, verses 8 through 24. Here is what it says. Then the word of the Lord came to him, that is, Elijah. Go at once to Zarephath in the region of Sidon and stay there. I have directed a widow there to supply you with food. So he went to Zarephath. When he came to the town gate, a widow was there gathering sticks. He called to her and asked, Would you bring me a little water in a jar so I may have a drink? As she was going to get it, he called, And bring me, please, a piece of bread. As surely as the Lord your God lives, she replied, I don't have any bread, 
only a handful of flour in a jar and a little olive oil in a jug. I am gathering a few sticks to take home and make a meal for myself and my son that we may eat it and die. Elijah said to her, don't be afraid. Go home and do as you've said, but first make a small loaf of bread for me from what you have and bring it to me and then make something for yourself and your son. For this is what the Lord says, the God of Israel says. The jar of flour will not be used up and the jug of oil will not run dry until the day the Lord sends rain on the land. She went away and did as Elijah had told her. So there was food every day for Elijah and for the woman and her family. For the jar of flour was not used up, and the jug of oil did not run dry, in keeping with the word of the Lord spoken by Elijah. That's pretty cool. If I've lost you, you can see what's, hopefully you see what's happening. Elijah comes to this woman, says, can I have bread? She says, I don't have any. He says, make me some bread, and then you're going to have everything that you need. God provides. Verse 17. Sometime later, the son of the woman who owned the house became ill. He grew worse and worse and finally stopped breathing. She said to Elijah, what do you have against me, man of God? Did you come to remind me of my sin and kill my son? Give me your son, Elijah replied. He took him from her arms, carried him to the upper room where he was staying, and laid him on his bed. Then he cried out to the Lord, Lord my God, have you brought tragedy even on this widow I am staying with by causing her son to die? Then he stretched himself out on the boy three times and cried out to the Lord, Lord my God, let this boy's life return to him. The Lord heard Elijah's cry, and the boy's life returned to him, and he lived. Elijah picked up the child and carried him down from the room into the house. He gave him to his mother and said, Look, your son is alive. Then the woman said to Elijah, Now I know that you are a man of God and that the word of the Lord from your mouth is the truth. So far as I can tell, there are two ways that we can take this story. One of the ways that you can take this story, and it's probably the most natural response, is to see this story as something strange something out of the ordinary as God doing a thing that God doesn't normally do when I was researching this text and thinking through man how can we experience this story I found a number of cool stories of God doing similar things where it's just you know there's no food in the pantry and then somebody shows up with a food full ready to just fill it up for the for the family and everybody else there's these stories of this God miraculously providing for people who don't have anything and that is one way that you can take this story God doing something strange but if you do, then the result will probably be that you'll walk away wondering, when is God going to do this for me? I wonder if I'm ever going to see something like this. I wonder if I'm ever going to experience God's miraculous provision in the same way that the people in this story experienced it. Now again, that's an understandable response, but what if when we read the story this way, we totally miss the point? You see, the second way to take the story is to recognize or to at least see that this is something ordinary, that this is something normal. Like, what if the point is not so much, look at this crazy thing God sometimes does, but instead, notice what God is always doing. Now, if you paid attention, you probably are thinking, like, how could this be ordinary? There's nothing normal about what's taking place here, about there being an empty cupboard, and then there's just miraculously enough food to continue making bread. Like, that is not an ordinary thing. I would suggest that maybe it is. I actually think that this is an important thing for understanding how miracles work in the Bible as a whole. Miracles are not just look at this crazy thing that God did. They're actually a picture, a microwaved experience of what God is doing in the bigger picture. So Jesus calms the storm. Yeah, that's because he plans on being, bringing peace to all creation. So Jesus heals the sick people. Yeah, that's because like long-term, he offers to bind all of our wounds. Would well, Jesus raise this person back from the dead? Yeah, that's because Jesus plans on resurrecting all those who believe in him so that they might live with him forever. These things are pictures. They're visible demonstrations of the invisible power of God that is always at work. Uh, let me focus in on one detail in this story. Bread. Now, it smells good, but like, why bread? It's not even fancy, you know what I'm saying? It kind of, this one kind of looks fake. I don't know what the one looked like there, but like why, like, why are biscuits such a big deal in this story? Bread is literally about as ordinary as you can possibly get. You take some flour, some oil, maybe a little water, you throw it together, you put it in the heat, and voila, you got some bread. And yet some of life's deepest secrets are hidden here. Could it be possible that their secret to life is found in bread? Like, could it be possible that their secret to life is in a baguette? I don't know, like, what if it's true? Bread certainly has a lot to teach us. 
I, I don't know if you recognize the name Malcolm X. I hope you do. He was a, 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 he was a black leader in the civil rights era years and years, decades and decades ago. He actually lived up in this part of the country for the majority of his life. And he lived around the same time as Martin Luther King Jr. And they had similar goals of, of bringing restoration and freedom to black folks here in America. They went about it in pretty different ways. They weren't exactly close buddies because King advocated nonviolence and patience. And Malcolm X was a bit more intense. He was more about, no, you got to like make it happen and you got to be loud like he was nothing if not loud and earlier this summer I read his autobiography fascinating read and he tells a story about a childhood experience that he always remembered and it really marked him as a man he talks about how when he was a kid he would come home from school and his mom would be baking bread she'd be making these little biscuits for dinner that night and for breakfast the next morning and he had a bunch of older siblings and they would ask mom can I have some bread and she'd say no go go away you know get out of here, get out of the kitchen but he would go in and mama can I have some bread and she'd say no get out of the kitchen but he would persist no no no, mama can I have some bread can I have some bread can I have some bread and he would just and some of you do this to your moms he would just annoyingly ask and ask and ask and ask until she finally gave him some bread and then she would say to him on a regular basis why can't you be kind and sweet like your older siblings and he thought to himself you know for all their kindness and sweetness they're hungry <laughs> and I'm not he said he learned that day that if you want things to happen in this world you got to be loud there is no Malcolm X without being loud and apparently there is no lesson about loudness without bread bread's actually a big deal in the Bible too you know it's mentioned 366 times that's like a loaf of bread for every day of the year even on leap year you know what I'm saying I guess a lot of bread and it shows up in key moments too Maybe you've heard the story of God leading his people in the Old Testament through the wilderness for 40 years, and they're like, God, we're hungry, and he drops this stuff down from the earth called manna. It just sort of forms on the ground. It's manna. Well, what is it? Well, it's sort of like, well, it's like this, it's like this bread. Maybe you heard of some stories from Jesus' life that are told in Scripture, like whenever he's in the wilderness and he's being tempted, and the enemy comes and he tempts him to turn stones into bread, not chocolate cake right like like not ice cream bread like it's right there maybe you know that when jesus taught us to pray he says give us this day our daily bread maybe you heard about the time whenever he had five thousand people out in front of him and he had to feed them and all he had was five loaves of bread and a couple of fish bread shows up regularly in the scriptural story and it actually if you pay attention to the details in this text you'll recognize bread's kind of a big deal there's no meat in this text I don't know how well you've been locked into what Brad's been saying and so far what we've been teaching, but in the previous experience where Elijah is fed by some ravens, it specifically says multiple times that he is given bread and meat. And yet in this story, the meat is gone. It's just bread. Like meat is nice, but bread is essential. <laughs> like without bread, you're dead. That's how it works. And I think, I really think that bread here is a symbol of life. I don't know if you noticed that life is woven throughout the story. So in chapter 17, verse 1, when Elijah shows up, he says, As the Lord, the God of Israel, lives whom I serve. Then down in verse 12, the woman says, As surely as the Lord your God lives. And there later on in that verse, she says, I'm about to go home and make a meal for myself and my son, that we may eat it and die. A little bit later on, whenever her son is sick and he seems to have passed away, she says to Elijah, Did you come to remind me of my sin and kill my son? Then Elijah does that weird ritual where he like gets on top of the kid and then he says to praise to God, Lord my God, let this boy's life return to him. And the Lord heard his cry and the boy's life returned to him. And he lived and he said to her, look, your son is alive. This story is ultimately not about miracles or rain or bread. This story is about a question. Will God provide life? Can you trust God to provide life? everything you need this is literally the oldest question there is this was the question facing eve in the garden in the opening chapters of the book of genesis I, maybe you heard she was there and god but eve and adam together in the garden and said you can eat from all the trees but i don't want you to eat from this one tree in the middle of the garden the tree of the knowledge of good and evil that serves a different purpose stay away from it and then there's this voice that comes from within the garden the voice of the serpent that says did god really say now, literally, the words are, did God really say? But if you pay attention, you recognize the question that she's being asked is, are you sure that you can trust him to provide what you really need? It's the same question that's facing the Israelites during the time of Elijah. 
you've probably picked up on there's these other gods in the area like the god Baal or the Baals. This was a god or a set of gods. They were, it was a fertility god, which isn't just about sex, although that's part of it, but it's more about like this was a god. If you worship him, you will be provided with what you need for life. Your crops will produce fruit and the rain will come down from heaven and you'll be able to have children. It was a god that if you trust in him, will provide life. And the Israelites had to make a decision. Are we going to trust in Yahweh or are we going to trust in Baal? And it's the same question facing us today. We don't have Baal, but you still got to ask the question, can you trust that God will provide what you need? I mean, if you do, if you do trust that, then, then doing what God says would come pretty automatically. I'll never forget, man, some of the conversations that we'll have this week, I promise you I'll remember them forever. I'll never forget this conversation I had a couple years ago with a young lady at a place much like this. We'll call her Dana. That's not her real name, but we'll call her that. So Dana was a girl who came up to me after a service, and it was a message that was all about, you know, letting go of the sin and following Jesus. And if you've been here, you kind of get the drill. And she, she was talking to me about this relationship she had with her boyfriend. And she said, I don't understand why God says I can't be intimate with my boyfriend. Like, that doesn't make sense to me. And so I laid out the biblical teaching, and I laid out some of the practical consequences on a relationship. If you go too far too fast and and i'm honestly thinking i'm giving a pretty good answer and she's just not budging and so i kind of like recognized i'm not getting anywhere and i said you you don't really want to hear what i'm saying do you and she's like well i mean honestly not really like we're already being you know intimate and here's the thing like if i tell him we're done i'm pretty sure i'm going to lose him and i'm thinking okay now we got to the point because the question is do you provide do you trust that god will provide enough even if you lose him. A couple years ago, I was at a move event and I was talking to a young man, we'll call him Adam, and he was a young man who was wrestling with his calling in life. What does he want to do? And some of you are there. And, and I try very carefully not to pressure anybody into doing one thing or another because we believe that kingdom work is something that you can do no matter your job. But this young man was wrestling with a call to like church ministry, vocational ministry, and I was just trying to push him toward God and ask some questions to get him to think. And it became very clear to me that he was indeed believing that God was calling him to ministry, but he was afraid because he had a plan to be an engineer and this plan was more secure and this plan was more safe and this was the plan that his parents won. I actually got an email from his mom the next week. She was not pleased with me and I'm thinking, listen, all I did was tell your son to listen to Jesus. You know what I'm saying? And he's wrestling with this over the week and I'm telling him, listen, man, like if Jesus is calling you to do this, you just do it. But that's not a decision I can make for you. That's a decision you have to make for yourself. He didn't make that decision. Like, I don't know, maybe he's being faithful now. I kind of lost track of him, but I'm just in that moment thinking the question here is not anything other than do you trust that if you do what God says, he will provide what you need? What you think about God, like not what you would say about God, but what actually comes to your mind when you think about God is the most important thing about you because it will drive everything you do. And I think specifically on this point, do you trust him? So, like, do you? Don't, please don't answer the question too quickly. I think we answer the question way too quickly. So, well, yeah, of course I do. God provides. Yeah, like that's the secret. That's your secret. That's literally like one of the first things that I learned. Maybe you're thinking like that's it. That's old news. Like the first prayer that I learned to pray was God is great. God is good. Let us thank him for our food. He provides, right? Like everybody knows that if God is real and if what Jesus says about him is true, that he provides what we need. Does everyone know that? Do you? And if you do, then, then how, come, how come it's not easier for you to do what he said? My favorite children's book is a book called um, There's No Such Thing as Dragons. Maybe you read it when you were a kid. It's about this little kid named Billy Bixby. And Billy walks into his room one day, and he sees a dragon on his bed. It's a cute little thing. It's about the size of a house cat. And so he goes downstairs, and he says, Mama, there's a dragon on my bed. And you can imagine what she said. Billy, there's no such thing as dragons. And so he's thinking, well, if there's no such thing as dragons, I guess I might as well ignore this thing, you know? And, and it's fine for a couple days, but then it becomes a problem because the dragon's not going anywhere. And one day the dragon eats all of Billy's pancakes, which is just really, really sad. And every time 
time the dragon takes a nap, he grows. So he's getting bigger and bigger. And it gets to a point where the mom, in order to clean the house, she has to like do some inside, but then she has to like go outside the house and reach around the dragon in order to get to the things that she's trying to clean. But she still refuses to believe or acknowledge that the dragon exists. And so the dragon continues to eat and sleep and grows. And it gets so big to where his legs are going out the doors and his head is coming out the attic window and his tail is going out one of the windows. And, and then one day he's just kind of in the house or the house is on him rather and he smells this bread truck, this bakery truck that goes by and catches a whiff of that bread and he just runs after this thing. House is gone. Dad comes home from work. The house is not there. It's like, what's going on? And the mailman says, oh, no, no, they went over here. And so he goes to where they are and sure enough, there they are sitting up on top of the dragon's head right outside the attic window. And the mom still refuses to acknowledge that the thing exists. And Billy's fed up by this point. So he says, Mom, there is a dragon. And she finally admits it. And as soon as she does, that thing starts to shrink. And it takes the house back to where it belongs. And it continues to shrink until it's a manageable size. Uh, by the end of the story, everybody in the town believes two things. Number one, dragons exist. And number two, they are much more pleasure, they're much more enjoyable to be around when they're the size of a house cat. But at the very end, on the very last page, the mom says to Billy, But why did he have to get so big? And Billy gives this brilliant response. He says, I don't know. Maybe he just wanted to be noticed. If you don't pay attention to the unbelief that is present in your heart and mind, it will grow to unmanageable proportions and it will threaten to take over your life. So can we just please acknowledge together that sometimes trusting God is hard? Can you do that for me? Can we just notice that we don't always trust him as well as we maybe think we should? Can we just admit that even here in this place, those of us who say we're in on the Jesus thing sometimes find it difficult to just let go and trust him? Well, sure, sure, if God is real, if God is real, and if what Christianity says about him is true, then trusting him should be easy. But those are some extra large ifs. <laughs> I mean, it's just bread. Maybe. Or maybe there's more here than meets the eye. God can provide everything you need for well-being, for sustenance, for happiness, for life. Is this something you believe? Is he someone you trust? <laughs>